Our last feature for this evening is an associated press story on our beloved city. Since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the NYPD has become one of the country's most aggressive domestic intelligence agencies. It's also been hailed as a model for policing the post-9-11 era. The biggest indicator of its success is that there has been no significant attack, terrorist attack on New York since. But working over several months, a Washington, D.C.-based investigative team from the Associated Press exposed how, as this headline shows, the NYPD spies on New York. The AP found that New York's finest operates far outside its borders and targets ethnic communities in ways that would run afoul of civil liberties rules if practiced by the federal government. It does so with unprecedented <coughs> help from the CIA. Neither the city council, which finances the NYPD, nor the federal government, which contributes hundreds of millions of dollars to the <coughs> NYPD each year, is told exactly what's going on. What we didn't know until the AP told us was that the NYPD had dispatched undercover agents known as rakers into minority neighborhoods as part of a human mapping program. They've also monitored daily life in bookstores, bars, cafes, and nightclubs. They've even put under surveillance a beauty supply store that sells chemicals that could be used for making bombs. Police have also used informants known as mosque crawlers to monitor sermons even when there is no evidence of wrongdoing. They planted informants among Muslim student groups, including here at Columbia, but also beyond New York to Rutgers and Yale. NYPD officials have scrutinized imams and gathered intelligence on cab drivers and food cart vendors, jobs often done by Muslims. The CIA, which is prohibited from spying on Americans, helped build many of these operations. The AP team interviewed more than 40 current and former NYPD and federal officials. They got documents that showed the existence of the, of the demographics unit, a squad of 16 officers fluent in five languages and ordered to map ethnic communities in the tri-state area. The NYPD says the spy unit doesn't exist. Now, thanks to the AP, we know it's otherwise. So. Matt Apuzzo and Eileen Sullivan, what were two Washington, D.C. reporters doing prowl, prowl, prowling around New York? What prompted this look into NYPD's secret surveillance operations? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we didn't ever expect this would be a series. Uh, we um, sort of started in, in kind of a weird way. Adam Goldman and I who's another member of our team, uh, had been covering a lot of national security stuff. And we were really interested at, at the end of 2010, we were doing a lot on, uh, we were doing a project on CIA accountability, trying to figure out what happened to the CIA officers who had been involved in a lot of the big sort of mishaps, uh, kidnapping the wrong guy, sort of fiascos of the previous 10 years. And in the course of doing that, we just sort of heard, um, kind of what you were talking about, just as an aside about, um, oh, you know, in the NYPD's raking program. And um, these were in the, for people who are gonna go off and do interviews, um, these are in the moments in the interview when you're like furiously writing the important stuff and then like you kind of just let them go off and, and say what you want and you use that as a moment to catch up. Like listen to that stuff because that, that's where the good story was. Um, so we thought we were going to write sort of one big story, and uh, we thought it would run maybe the beginning of 20, the spring of 2011. Osama bin Laden, uh, you may have read about in the newspaper, he was killed. Um, so that, <laughs> that occupied a good deal of our time. Uh, and then we decided, well, you know, um, we'll, we'll run one big story for the 9-11 anniversary. Um, and so Adam and I kind of put that together. We consulted with Eileen, who, as you said in your introduction, knows more about terrorism than any, I think, any other journalist in the country. Um, and we sort of put out one big story, and the thing just snowballed and became, a, you know, this thing that has consumed our lives for a year. Um, but it was, yeah, it was never planned. So. Um, Did you want to say something, Eileen? No, I, I think, I mean, he, he handled it. <laughs> 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 I wasn't quite reading the face signals there. <laughs> okay, the NYPD, as our students know, because they're reporting out of new neighborhoods around New York, the NYPD is one of the most secretive police departments in the country. So how did you get people inside the NYPD to talk to you? 
and why would they talk to you? Um, well, you know, from well, so that's what we do, right? I mean, you get people who don't want to talk to you to talk to you. So the thing that I think that our team does really well is that we don't care if something's been covered or if it's not necessarily like an area of our expertise. Like, you know, we didn't know anything about the NYPD. I mean, I think I, rem I remember sitting down one of the first things, you know, when we didn't know what the hell we were going to do. I think we sat down at Google because because young people today, all we do is Google, right? Um, so we sat down in Google, right? And we said, uh, I typed in NYPD intelligence, site colon LinkedIn.com. And I just want to see everybody in LinkedIn who had mentioned NYPD intelligence. And, um, and I came across somebody, and I went to Eileen. I said, hey, do you know this guy? Because he used to work for Homeland. And Eileen said, yeah, I know him. And he only worked in Intel for like five minutes. And Eileen set up a lunch, and we went there. And he didn't know anything about what the hell we were interested in, but it was great because um, I'm really into like understanding the way an organization works. Because if you can crack an organization, if you can understand the subculture that you're covering, the organizational, the way it works, then you understand the way information flows. And so he was kind of able, like, all right, well, there's this guy, and he answers to this guy, and this is over here, and this is how. We're. So they're like, all right, well, I just need to talk to all those people. Um, but we go to people's houses at night. I'm a big believer in that. If you can get somebody in their sweatpants, then you know you've changed the dynamic. So a little you bit. just knock on someone's some. <laughs> you knock on a police officer's door, and then what? Um. So all right. So that's not my first step. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not our first step. Okay. But I mean, my point is, is that if somebody's not talking, why would it? We call people in their offices and we expect them to talk to us about stuff, about what's going on in their office. It's like the dumbest thing. Of course they're going to say, I can't talk to you about this. Right. I mean, imagine how if anybody called you in your office and was like, I want to tell you, if he's your manager, a bad manager, yeah, he's sitting right there. I mean, so we do that. It's just such a dumb thing. So we, you know, we reach out and we call them and we say, you know, hey, we're working on a story about the transformation of the NYPD at post 9-11, which is true. And could we get a cup of coffee? And a lot said yes, and some said no. And for the people we really needed, and we'd go back to them two or three times, they wouldn't talk to us, yeah, I mean, you just go to their house and knock on the door. Um, and you knock and, on the door, he like, opens the door, and what like do you say? 80% of the time, they slam the door in your face, but 20% <laughs> of the time, you have the best interview you're going to have. Um, so I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, you, you know, Eileen, why would, why would these people talk to you? I mean, you've been covering terrorism right. for a long time. Why well, would people who hold secrets about, you know? I think, I think there are a couple of reasons. And, um, you know, one of them is that some of them are really proud of what they've done. They take a, a lot of pride in protecting New York, and they get up in the morning to do this, and, and they think that they've put together this very unique um, domestic intelligence program. And others, um, feel a little uncomfortable with some of what they're doing. I mean, just with interactions with their own bosses that, you know, they're bringing them information saying we're not getting anything and yet they're going back and they're told, you know, to get some more. And then I think that there's also a case, and, and you can add to this, but <clears throat> there it's so secretive what goes on there and there's just so much reluctance to talk about it, not just within the NYPD, but outside, particularly in Washington, and I say particularly in Washington because that's where we are, but Nobody wants to talk about this. So now you have, you know, somebody who gets up every day, believes in what he does, and no one's going to talk about it. Support against. I mean, that was. Uh, I think people wanted these stories to get out. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. I think, you know, the the lesson that I would I would say one of the takeaways is if you if you really throw yourself into this and and. and you can see any of this. I mean, you threw yourself at, at, at you know, at your photo essay. I mean, you threw yourself at the data. You threw yourself at the schools. If you know the institution, people are going to talk to you. I mean, if you don't know it and you aren't versed in it, you know, if you don't know that there's 2,700 methadone deaths and you can map them, well, then they can tell you, you know, go take a long walk off a short beer. Like, everything's fine. But if you know how the intel division works, they, it becomes a lot harder for them to tell you, no, 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 it works this way. Mm -hmm. So why was this story done by journalists based in Washington, D.C. and not by New York? 
reporters. Well, yeah. well, I think, I mean, like Matt explained how they came onto the story. I mean, it was through other stories that they were working on and the expertise on counterterrorism, particularly domestic policing, was based in Washington. So the three of us, even though I'm not on the investigative team, worked for the same editor. And here we had um, the subject matter expertise and the bodies and the editor, and um, we were able to do it. Yeah, and I just think, you know, it, it, it's, a, uh, it's an advantage of having a, a, a company and a structure that just says, this is a great story, yeah, do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that geographically, um, you know, we're not as limited as, as probably we used to be. Um, if there's a good story, we go follow it. Did you get pushback from your editors about using unnamed sources? Um, all right, so on covering national security, anonymous sources are kind of the, they kind of come with the territory, unfortunately. Um, but this story, these kinds of story, is I think what it's made for. Um, I think, I think that the awful, crappy overuse of anonymous sources, especially in Washington, is appalling, and we should fight back as as hard as we can. And I, frankly, nobody fights back harder than Eileen. Um, and but so here's the thing. So we reported that this unit, this, we, we had all this information about the demographics unit and the moss crawlers and these informant programs. And we've been pushing to get an interview with Ray Kelly. And we've been pushing to get an interview with Dave Cohen, who uh, was a former chief of clandestine operations to the CIA, who's now running intelligence to the NYPD. And we weren't getting it. And so we got a phone interview with the chief spokesman for the NYPD. And he went through all of our stuff and denied that this existed. Just flat out deny it. You're wrong. It's fiction. People are telling you fables. These are stories. This is not true. You're going to be embarrassed. You're going to write this. We're going to come out. We're going to say it's wrong. You're going to embarrass yourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to go into our, into our uh, bureau chief's office and say, good news. We got the NYPD interview, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> Uh, bad news, um, on the record, denial, and we don't have just about anybody saying anything on the record, it's all anonymous. Uh, how much do you trust us? Uh, <laughs> Um, we and had it helps that, I mean, we've worked for these editors before we've worked on, I mean, when you deal with anonymous sources, you're explaining not only how you got the information, but why, why your source would be privy to that information, whether this is something that, you know, you need a second source on, and what does that second source, I mean, if the, if the two people were in the same briefing, I mean, that's not good enough, you know, I mean, somebody who's in a different briefing, who's getting the same information. So we already had that going into it. They trusted us, they knew, you know, how we worked, and they asked us all the hard questions. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we had compiled all of our notes in these black, gigantic, three-inch black binders, and um, all of the clips, all the notes, and um, we felt pretty good about our, about our sourcing. And frankly, our bureau chief never for once was like, oh, they're going to deny it. Maybe we should, they basically, she said, great, great, let's get that denial way up high in the store. I mean, it was, I mean, that was such a wonderful thing to have that kind of support. Um, and then, you know, we only ended up getting all these documents stamped NYPD secret that proved everything we had written was true. We only got that like months later. So, I mean, it was a real gamble, I think, by our bosses to go out on all these anonymous let, sources. Let me get this right. You got the documents after you had run the story. The first story, yeah. Uh -huh. A lot of people came forward and said, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, a lot of people came forward, including people who hadn't talked to us before and we didn't even know existed came forward and was yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah. I do that. That's yeah. my job. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I mean, you know, we, uh, we had people who, and then, and then we realized that all, we didn't know what documents were out there and we'd been asking for documents and we weren't getting them, but once we sort of got this tiny little trickle of documents and we knew what to ask for and we knew what numbers they had on them, I mean, nobody, I, nobody had ever seen anything like this. And we could say, do you have a document that looks like this? And people would say, yes. Or I can get you that document, you know? And so then it was, you know, like, like Sue said, then you're just going through all your, your master source list and be like, have you ever heard of a document called this? Look in your files. Do you have anything like this? Um, but yeah, that first story, we, I mean, we put our editors in a spot where they kind of had to say, yeah, we trust you. Um, 
Well, you were also sort of in the spot here because some readers reacted by saying, you know, this is the price we pay for our security and our safety, that some, we have to give up some of our civil liberties. I mean, how did you, how did you cope with this, with this sort of backlash and reaction to, the, to this series? Well, this has been a constant theme since 9-11. And in Washington, something that I hear all the time is you don't have to give up your privacy and civil liberties for safety. There's a balance. And uh, I mean, a lot of what Washington was saying to do, you know, telling local police departments how to police and engage the Muslim community was not lining up with what New York was doing. And so you had Washington saying something, describing best practices that New York wasn't following. And all the while, I mean, it, it seems like you're giving up your own privacy and civil liberties. Um, and it just, it's, I think we found that it, the people who were okay with it weren't the people being spied on, and I think it, history is going to tell us sort of the effect of this down the road. I mean, the next attack, whoever is at fault, I mean, this, this model could be replicated, I think, anywhere in the country to some extent. And, and so, I, I just gotta say, I'm so sick of 9-11 being used as a way to tell reporters that they can't report stuff. <laughs> I mean, the number of times that journalists get called now and say you can't have this information because it's security. You can't report what you know because it's security. You know, um, everybody knows everything there is to know about the Osama bin Laden raid, right? Because it makes everybody look good. And, um, you know, Jim Risen, who was probably sitting here uh, with one of his, when he, after one of his Pulitzers, um, told me something that really sticks with me, is that if you, if you do this job, national security or investigative or whatever, you can go down the road and have it be, you, you get people at the government to tell you what they think about other countries or what they think about groups, what they think about organizations, and then you report that. And, and you can go that way, and it's really easy to go that way. Um, or you can go the way of saying, what's our government doing often to our own citizens? And really poor reporting about the way our government responds to those external factors. Um, and that's the only thing that interests me. So I'm, I'm just sick of people telling us, because of 9-11, you know, the press has to it has to change the way it does business and has to be, you know, uh, uh, has to bend over backwards. You know, we, need, we need a free press. We need people like this, more, you know, here more than we've ever needed because of 9-11. And we're, you know, not going to stop that because of 9-11. Okay, now it's your turn to ask questions. Hi, my name is Beth McKernan. Um, I was wondering, given how notoriously uncooperative the NYPD are, since the publication of your stories, um, do you foresee new challenges in following up on where this goes now? Do you think they're going to be even tighter about what's, what information gets leaked to journalists and what people who work at this unit are going to be able to um, give to you? Well, I, I mean, leaking the information to journalists, the NYPD, I, they didn't leak anything. Right. I mean, it, so they, I think they'll continue their leaking policy as it fits them and suits right. them. I mean, it is, it is crazy. I mean, you, I don't need to tell you guys this. You can't even get a police report in this city, yeah. right? I mean, that is crazy. If you told, you know, 21-year-old Matt Apuzo who covered a police department in a small town that in the greatest city in the world you couldn't get a police, a police report, I mean, that's crazy. And I mean, and I've said this a million times, you, you know, every journalist in the country, in this city, should be standing shoulder to shoulder and saying that's unacceptable. And, you know, police, police chiefs and mayors of big cities shouldn't be able to get out of meetings with editorial boards and interviews with, you know, people who make, you know, more money than you guys make, and you guys are out trying to get police reports, and we should be demanding this stuff. Um, so you're saying they couldn't be any more stricter than they already are? Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> you try, you're right, I guess anything's possible. Right, yeah. um, I mean, they could put up a wall, I guess, I mean, <laughs> um, around, the, around one police plaza. Next question, please. My name is Caroline Chen. Um, I was wondering, when you started out, 
Knowing how opaque the NYPD is, how do you d determine what the minimum amount of information you need is in order to prove your hypothesis? Because it's one thing to have a story and there's another thing to be able to prove it. And I think sometimes the question is like, what if you couldn't get enough police officers? Like how <coughs> many would be enough for you to have this story? Or what if you had only partial documents but not all? Like when do you say we've got enough to actually write this? There's a lot of frustrated NYPD journalists in here, man. <laughs> um, Indeed. Uh, I don't know, was it Sue, somebody said if you have the one mistake, Right, they'll, they'll pick it apart. So I mean, the number of stuff we left on the cutting room floor because we only had one or two people, I mean, it, you know, it's just crazy because we just weren't, we just couldn't be wrong. So I don't know, there was no set number, but we went through a lot of, that was what we went through more hand wringing on than anything else. How can we be totally sure on that point? When we couldn't be sure we left it out or that incident, if you know, if you, we didn't know what, you know, there were incidences where just crazy stuff happened. And we knew where it happened. We were kind of squishy on when it happened. And they just said, no, no, we're not going to go out on a limb on anything. So. Yes. Hi. So um, in addition to opacity, the NYPD has something of a culture of lying. Um, cops get caught lying all the time, both for the lowest level beat cop to Paul Brown, who speaks for the entire department and Commissioner Kelly, as he did to you. He pretty much admitted to lying to you during the course of your investigation. How do you feel about the impact that your investigation had in terms of the NYPD's impunity, essentially, with regards to how loose it is with its uh, relationship to the truth? I, I want Eileen to answer that question. Because um, <laughs> you know what? I don't care about the, about the effect that it'll have on sort of the, the police spokesman. But I mean, Eileen was kind of our point person on being, you know, really in the, com in the Muslim communities, and that's where I think we really cared about what the impact was. I mean, we don't really care about what, what Paul Brown thought of our series. And what I found is um, when we would get these reports and um, we'd go to the community and interview people and show them their names in these police reports, I started to see this pattern of you know, people being shocked and laughing like that's ridiculous why, you know that's ridiculous why would I be in that report what that's my friend she runs a travel business she has kids that they go to school with my kids that's just crazy and I mean throughout the day you know hours later it, it gets really upsetting you know we're, we're in this report because we're not doing anything at all I mean how is that possible and so many of these people that we interviewed are immigrants and this is not what they expected out of America I mean it, and it was it was really interesting to see that and, and the other thing that I found interesting is that some people when they would see these documents said thank you I have thought that this was going on I thought that I've been being spied on but no you know everyone says no it's not going on it's not going on now I have proof I mean imagine if you have felt for years that someone is following you or watching you or just some like creepiness around you and, and then you know everyone's saying you're crazy that's not what we do in America thank you you know <laughs> people felt but then the next thing is well now what do we do about it I mean we don't have a government in Washington that has any interest in standing up for us and saying you know is this right or is this wrong our city council is you know backing away from its ability to do oversight um, it, it's just, it, it, and that's the really frustrating part that these members of the community are, are facing now is, okay, so we've proven here this is happening, we thought it was happening, but now what? And we're, we're still waiting and, for that. giving voice to those, those voices who don't get, frankly, covered well in, uh, by us or by anybody um, was a much better effect and, and was a much more meaningful outcome than you know, what the NYPD thought. I mean, frankly, the NYPD's response to this all has been, yeah, we spy on Muslims, you're welcome. Um, and, but that's not like a flippant joke. They say, we do this, and, and I think Mayor Bloomberg is like, has said, and when you go back and write your stories, remember that we're, we're doing that and keeping you safe. So, you're welcome. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I've been covering the Syrian American community here in New York for my beat with my class. And I used one of the documents that was released um, as a part of your series. And while it was 
an invasion of privacy, it was helpful for reporting. I went um, absolutely restaurant by restaurant. I went to every single place listed. You ate really well. And I did. I had so much on this. Um, but I, uh, I was wondering what the next steps for your investigation are, because most of what I found was the report sucked that every single one of the places listed was wrong, that they said that it was Syrian owned and it was owned by someone from Lebanon. Lebanon. It said this is where Palestinians gathered and the hookah bar was full of people from Yemen. So I'm wondering if you're doing any work as far as the NYPD is not only spying, but they're bad. <laughs> I, um, I don't think they're going back and correcting the record on that, but we saw that uh, you know over and over again. I mean, some of the stuff we just had to laugh at. It's uh, even in the, you know, they're singling out people for being suspicious or a threat, and they've spelled their names six different ways in a report. I mean, it's, who, are you talking about the same person? I mean, it's just. Um, stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> more, more coming. Yes. Um, you mentioned some <clears throat> anonymous sources that spoke to you that felt guilty about doing so. No, no, not guilty. I think they felt introspective. Introspective? <laughs> that, no, but I'm serious, I, I do think that I don't think anybody felt guilty. I think they felt like 10 years later it was okay to, to look at did it, did it work and was it smart. And I, think that, and I do want to make that distinction because I don't think that, that that's guilt. Okay. What, my question would be, uh, did you ever encounter any anonymous sources, Muslim officers, who perhaps uh, pro were in the process of leaking you more information than non-Muslim officers? Were Muslim officers more willing to leak information than non-Muslim officers? Um, I don't know. I mean, it didn't really break down that way for it. I mean, it's just not something I really, a willingness to leak isn't sort of the calculation. When you do these things, it's just this very fluid process and you're talking to people over a long period of time and, you know, what becomes a conversation and what becomes a, you know, my conversation is your leak, right? Like, a leak is just a conversation that you didn't want me to have. So it, um, I, I, I don't think I... I guess my question would be, were they more willing to come forward? And, no. And, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. So this, is, this will be our last question about New York. After that, I invite you all to ask any question well, relevant to the stories, of course, of the panel. We'll have 15 minutes for like a, a general Q&A. Yes, please. I'm actually quite curious about the CIA. They're quite a cagey organization, and uh, yeah, sorry, understatement. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> Severe understatement, sorry. Um, I was wondering if, what were their comments on your story? Uh, no comment. Um, I mean, that, 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 that's I mean they did, did an investigation. That's right. They did, they in, opened an investigation, which at the CIA is actually kind of a big deal. They did an internal investigation, and um, uh, they, there was a covert officer just back from the Middle East who was embedded at the NYPD. He was one of the most senior guys at, in the CIA. And he had just started his tour of duty at one police plaza a, a couple weeks before our story ran. And they pulled him home. They brought him. They said, we're not gonna, that's not the relationship we're going to have with police departments anymore. Um, and they did an investigation into how it all went down. And they said, look, Whether we know. that was appropriate for him right. to go there in the first place. And they said, Okay, when it started, it, we, don't, we don't think we ever did anything that qualified as domestic spying, but we recognize that, um, that we sent him there without the right oversight and without having it reviewed by lawyers or without any rules, and we kept him there too long, and we didn't really good, keep a good tabs on what exactly he was doing. Um, but lesson learned, we won't do that again. And this is all, of course, anonymous because they won't give us the report. Thank you. You're welcome.